Hello, I'm Zeng Kaizong from Texas Tech University. I'm going to present our paper, Leveraging EM Side-Channel Information to Detect Through Hammer Attacks. This is a joint work with my colleagues at Vanderbilt University and UIUC. As we know, since the discovery of the Ruhammer bug, it has been continuously exploited to form a wide range of powerful Ruhammer attacks. An example is the just presented RAM Blade attack at the beginning of this session. In response, many defense techniques have been proposed in recent years, including several detection based approaches. However, as more elusive Ruhammer attacks are developed, the effectiveness of detection based Ruhammer defenses becomes questionable. Here, we propose to address the problem of Ruhammer attack detection from a new perspective, which is to find the patterns correlated with the Ruhammer attacks in some EM signals. The rationale is that EM signals are inevitably issued and can be hardly suppressed by an outside attacker. The question is, is this feasible? To answer this question, we need to think of whose EM signals we should investigate. For this, we first take a look at what components are always involved in a Ruhammer attack. As we know, hammering the DRAM to trigger the Ruhammer bug is the prerequisite for any Ruhammer attack. Hammering the DRAM is to repeatedly and rapidly access the same rules in a DRAM bank. There are several possible paths we can take to hammer the DRAM. We can flush or evict the CPU caches, or we can use some non-temporary instructions to bypass the CPU caches. Also, we may take advantage of some accelerators or I.O. devices to repeatedly access the DRAM in a rapid manner. No matter which path we take, three major hardware components must always be involved. That are the memory controller, memory bus, and the memory modules. So, we focus on the EM signals emanated from those components to try to find the information for our use. Given the fast switching behavior during hammering, we conjecture that there should be clear EM signals at the switching frequencies. So, we attempted to identify these signals directly. This is plausible, but unfortunately we didn't observe any such signals. We think there are two reasons. First, the switching frequencies are less than 15 MHz. Actually, in most cases, they are in between 4 MHz to 9 MHz. It isn't a clean frequency band. Too much noise exists. Second, the direct EM signals may be very weak, and measuring such long wavelength weak signals may require a physically large antenna. Clearly, we need to look for other possibilities. As we know, the DRAM bus is driven by a high-frequency clock. This clock intrinsically creates a periodic EM signal. This signal is strong and can propagate very far, which reduces the measurement requirements a lot. Some researchers have found that the strength of the clock's EM signal varies when the amount of activities driven by the clock changes. In other words, the signal is AM modulated by the activities. We know that when a carrier signal is AM modulated, there are sidebands appearing on both sides of the carrier frequency in the spectrum. The sidebands are symmetric about the carrier frequency, and they correspond to the spectrum of the modulating activity. Since nearly regular and lasting switching behavior is associated with a hammering attempt, if the DRAM clock signal carries such information through AM modulation, we expect to identify that information via some distinctive frequency patterns in the upper and lower sidebands of the modulated DRAM clock signal. We have conducted a large number of experiments that verify this idea. Here we show the spectra corresponding to six scenarios on a Haswell machine equipped with DDR3-1333. From the spectra we can see, when the DRAM is hammered, there are noticeable side lobes located on both left and right sides of the central spike. Beware of the vertical axis that is on a logarithmic dB scale. So if on a normal linear scale, 
these sideband patterns are even much more apparent. Let's look at how fast the DRAM is hammered in each of the last three scenarios. On average, we can see CR flush hammers at about 5.7 MHz, Move NTI hammers at about 6.5 MHz, and Eviction hammers at about 3.1 MHz. If we look at the spectra again, we can find that the locations of the patterns match the hammering frequencies and they conform to the effect of AM modulation. So, these sideband patterns are hammering correlated. So, now we see that we can use EM signals emanated from the DRAM clock to detect root hammer attacks. However, we still have two problems. One problem is that similar patterns may transiently arise due to some factors like noise. This will negatively affect the detection accuracy. The other problem is more severe. As we will see later on, a feature called spread spectrum clocking can significantly impair our detection. Okay, let's address the small problem first. We know that a hammering attempt to trigger the root hammer bug lasts for a period of time, like tens of milliseconds. This means the hammering correlated sideband patterns are very likely in each derived spectrum within that period of time. On the other hand, if some similar sideband patterns appear in a spectrum but not due to hammering, they may disappear soon. This temporal dependency and the hammering correlated sideband patterns imply that two vertical stripes symmetric about the DRAM clock frequency will be in the spectrogram during a hammering attempt. Using this feature to detect root hammer attacks will greatly increase our detection accuracy. Okay, now let's move on to the other problem caused by the use of SSC, which stands for spread spectrum clocking. Why SSC is used? Because there are electromagnetic compatibility regulations in almost every country. These regulations impose limits on the energy of EM signals issued from electronic devices at any frequency above 30 MHz. Many high-frequency clock signals in a computer system, including the DRAM clock, are strong enough to violate the legal limits. So SSC is used to vary the clock frequency over a range, such that the energy is spread over that range. Unfortunately, SSC can make the hammering correlated sideband patterns unrecognizable because SSC is on by default. To robustly detect hammering correlated sideband patterns, we need to counter the effect of SSC. To this end, let's take a closer look at this feature. Basically, SSC uses frequency modulation to vary the clock frequency in accordance with the signal F sub M O T. F sub M O T is generated by a hardware chip and is undocumented. So we can't rely on knowing its exact mathematical expression to counter the scattering effect of SSC. Nevertheless, F sub M of T is usually a periodic function. That means if we know how to cope with one period of F sub M of T, we can reverse the SSC effect for any long sequence of samples. To better understand our counter SSC technique, Let's look at SSC from the perspective of its effect on phase angles. Let's assume the clock signal sampled at time t has a phase angle phi sub zero, and the sampling period is an integer multiple of the clock cycle. If there is no spread spectrum clocking, the subsequent samples should have the same phase angle. What if SSC is applied? Since SSC modulates the clock frequency, we will see phase angle changes in the following samples. For example, if the spread range is below the original frequency, we will see the changes in the clockwise direction. How phase angle is changed depends on the F sub M of T function. Because the F sub M of T function is periodic, we will see a repeated change pattern. From the viewpoint of phase angle changes, Reversing the SSC effect is to compensate each sample's phase, which equals to getting multiplied by a complex exponential. This forms the basis of our disk spreading technique. Our disk spreading technique 
consists of three main parts. First, we sample the DRAM clock signal and derive the phase angle difference sequence from the sampled values. From the sequence, we can easily observe the periodicity and derive a smaller sequence delta, which consists of the phase angle changes within one period. Since SSC is software independent, we only need to derive this sequence once for each hardware platform. Then we align samples measured during computation with the delta. Due to the existence of other signals, the phase angle differences may not be the same as the ones in delta, but only if they are aligned, the cross-correlation reaches the maximum. After alignment, we can compensate each sample with the phase angle rotation. As shown in the figure, we can make the hammering correlated sideband patterns reappear. One interesting point we want to mention is this spreading will actually help reduce background noise. This is because this spreading will act like SSC on such noise. Because of this, the robustness of our detection is increased. Based on the observations and the techniques we just described, we make a system named the Reader which stands for Ruhammer Attack Detection by a Radio. In our prototype, we use a software-defined radio, Lime SDR, to measure the EM signals. The antenna is pretty simple, especially the one showing on the right. Just the two pieces of metal wire connect to an antenna balloon. This can be easily mounted in any computer case. The measured signal is first processed by our disk spreading technique. Then we use the short-time Fourier transform to obtain spectrograms. We use a three-layer CNN model for classification. We continuously stream the spectrograms into the CNN model. The output is the probability of currently being hammered. The effectiveness of our reader system is evaluated against various hammering methods. For example, using CR flush, move NTI, or eviction, to perform either single-sided or double-sided hammering. We include one location hammering as well. To compare, we also run three legitimate applications. In the first scenario, a large array of size 256 megabytes is randomly accessed. So there will be a large number of cache misses, and the DRAM will be accessed very often. In the second video playing scenario, the video player will continuously use non-tempered instructions to load the video frames for decoding, so the memory is accessed very often as well. In the third scenario, GCC is used to compile a Linux kernel, which will generate a large number of CPU memory I.O. traffic. First, we evaluate our reader system on four platforms, A, B, C, and D. Our CNN model was trained using the positive and the negative examples collected from these four platforms. When the probability given by the CNN model is higher than the threshold, 0.85, it is considered to be a Ruhammer attack. From the detection results, we can observe the effectiveness of our system. Ruhammer attacks may be hidden inside malicious SGX enclaves. By evaluating our radar system against such enclaves on platform C, we conclude that it makes no difference to our detection. How about the platforms whose data has never been used in the original CNN model training? We evaluate our current CNN model on two new platforms, E and F, and we also change the memory modules of E and F to form another new platforms, E prime and F prime. Their data has never been used in training. From the results, we can observe the model works well for recognizing potential Ruhammer attacks on these new platforms. We also perform more evaluations against the three well-known tools that are publicly available for demonstrating Ruhammer attacks. The results still show the effectiveness of our reader. The false positive rate of our reader detection is also extremely low as illustrated by the evaluation results in terms of the SPEC 2006 benchmarks. We also deliberately introduced some random delays into each hammering iteration to try to circumvent the detection of radar. Here we create such a scenario. 
by adding B knobs in each hammering iteration, where B is randomly chosen in the range of 1 to M. As we can observe from the evaluation results on platform D, even when M reaches 500, it still couldn't circumvent the detection. Notice that if we use a very large M, it will become no longer possible to trigger the root hammer bug. From the spectra, we can see when random delays are introduced, the periodic behavior of hammering is disrupted to some extent, but their correlated sideband patterns are still recognizable for their use in detection. From the spectrum on the top, we can also find that on this platform, the switching behavior of hammering has strong second and third harmonics. Due to the time limit, we can't go through some other evaluations and experiments. If you are interested in knowing them, welcome to take a look at our paper. In conclusion, we have investigated how to leverage EM side-channel information to solve the root hammer attack detection problem. The basis is the observation of distinguishable sideband patterns correlated with hammering in the spectrum of the DRAM clock signal. Based on this observation, we have proposed and implemented a system named RADAR that can help set up effective and robust defenses against even elusive next-generation root hammer attacks. Although we use our disbanding technique, to reassemble the hammering correlated sideband patterns scattered by SSC. This approach is actually an independent contribution that may be used to form new EM side channel attacks. Thank you.